1991, Iraq was given 15 days to fully disclose all weapons of mass destruction. It was unfinished business from the first Gulf War. And we got it right. Well, I'm horrified that I was part of it. Is on death really hard. quickly and it was anticipated that the campaign would that militarily would go very quickly and the big question was well what comes after I remember calling my boss the three-star general the corps commander and I said I have good news and bad news and he said what's the good news and I said the good news is that we control Najaf he said terrific congratulations what's the bad news I said we control Najaf what do you want us to do with it where are these guys that told us in Kuwait that you just get us to Baghdad and we'll take it from there? He said, well, give them a call. I did. And they said they were still getting organized. So that meant there were no Iraqi authorities there to help us with that. Everyone thought George Bush was a hero. Then about a week after that, the looting started. And the citizens of Iraq realized, uh, there's no authority, none. And that's when our troubles really began. Driven by a near mystical determination to push Saddam Hussein from power, doubt and hesitation were terms the Bush administration didn't want to hear. And it had yet to forgive those who had stood in its way. La France a été l'objet d'une campagne massive à travers tous les médias américains, le Pentagone faisait de la désinformation. C'est-à-dire qu'il euh, disait ben, la France livre des armes à Saddam Hussein pour abattre nos avions. La France euh, fait tout pour que notre opération ne marche pas. Les Américains nous interdisaient d'utiliser la voie rapide de la route qui conduisait ou nous ramenait de l'aéroport, ce qui nous obligeait à prendre la voie lente, alors qu'il y avait une dizaine d'attentats par jour en moyenne. Les Américains, d'ailleurs, ne prenaient même pas cette autoroute, ils se déplaçaient en, en hélicoptère. Donc ils exposaient notre vie quasiment volontairement. Once on the ground, the Americans found they had to manage a country that was on its knees. The US Secretary of State Colin Powell and the National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice both urged the White House to accept its responsibilities. Powell and Condi are the ones who convinced the president that he has occupying power responsibilities under the Geneva Accords and under international law writ large and that he's got to stay. And then Jerry Bremer gets picked, and Jerry Bremer goes in to be the proconsul, and so forth and so on. The former diplomat, Paul Bremer, nicknamed Jerry, was chosen to head up the provisional authority. He became Iraq's de facto head of state and was given a free reign by President Bush, especially with regards to debarthification. The Ba'ath Party had been the only party under the Saddam Hussein dictatorship, and membership was the only way to get a high-level job, be it in government or in the army. I was present at a meeting before the invasion of Iraq with President Bush. Two decisions were made by the president. First was we would debathify only to a certain level. The second decision was one that we actually from military airplane dropped leaflets onto the soldiers and it said, soldiers of the Iraqi army, go home. We will call you back. One of the first things Bremer did when he was in Iraq was in some fashion turn around those two decisions and reverse them. He disbands the entire military. And I remember one of the colonels saying to me, do you know what that meant? That meant that something like 
50,000 Republican Guard soldiers went home with their weapons and said, I'm now opposing the government. Automatically, just like that. So Jerry did that. I was presented with the um, order before I left Washington. I was given it by the Defense Department and told that it had been coordinated entirely within the U.S. government. Bremer denied any responsibility, but said one mistake had been made, and that was trusting the Iraqis to carry out part of this task. People make false statements about it. They say that this order collapsed the Iraqi government. This is nonsense. The, the order was designed to affect only the top 2% of the party. In fact, one of the, one of the, the results was that uh, the school teachers were all thrown out. School teachers, you know, ha had to join the Ba'ath Party in order to be teachers. You know, they, they were no threat, by and large. Uh, and it, but kids weren't being taught in school because, because the, the, the teachers had been debathified. So it, 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 really was a, it really was a disaster. I don't think that some of the teachers, some of the people who have been at the level of university or doctorate in the universities were not the same. بل بعضهم كانت رسالته الدكتوراه او الماجستير عن خطابات صدام حسين هل يستحق هذا الاستاذ ان يكون استاذا في جامعه وهو يكتب رساله دكتوراه في خطابات صدام حسين Robert Grenier would visit the White House every week to keep the president abreast of how things were progressing in Iraq but one morning he was surprised to find that Paul Bremer had been invited to the meeting there's Paul Bremer sitting there. So which made it a little bit more uncomfortable because basically we were saying that the, the policies that are being pursued by Mr. Bremer are a disaster and this is what they're leading to. Um, but uh, we, we delivered that briefing to the president and the president looked at Bremer and, and I remember as clear as though it were yesterday, he, he said, what do you say, Bremer? And uh, Mr. Bremer said, I just don't see any way forward other than along the lines that we're pursuing right now. And uh, the, that was the end of the meeting, and things went on from there. And that really was the source of the original large numbers of individuals uh, who would become insurgents or extremists. Noting that you had some others, of course, who were truly more, who became true Al-Qaeda affiliates, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, led initially, of course, by Zarqawi until his death in 2006. But that was a, a these, these two decisions were truly catastrophic and represented setbacks from which we could never fully recover. I respect the uh, American generals who think that this was a mistake, but they didn't have the responsibility that I had, which was to get it right. And we got it right. Paul Bremer left Iraq after spending a year on the ground. On the 22nd of February 2006, a new wave of violence rocked the country. The Mimetaj de la mosquée de Samara, qui était un lieu historique, déclenche quelque chose qui, qui ressemble vraiment à une guerre civile. Avec un très grand nombre de, de, de morts, on, on était à, à Bagdad. Euh, à une moyenne, une moyenne de 3000 morts par mois. The different states in the region, so they encouraged the extremists to come from all the different countries to enter Iraq. They supplied them with hundreds or thousands of car bombs and the extremists uh, succeeded to instigate a sectarian tension among the 
Iraqis. To tackle this spike in violence, Bush called on the help of General Petraeus. He also agreed to deploy 30,000 additional troops at the start of 2007. It's what the Americans called the surge. What made the surge successful was not the surge of forces. It was the surge of ideas. It was the way we changed our strategy and our tactics on the ground. And all of that was 180 degrees different from what we had been doing prior to the surge. It was very clear to us that we needed to go back into the neighborhoods, that we, we had to secure the people, and we could only do that by living with the people. The Iraqi war also lifted the lid on some of the inhumane practices being used by the US military. 20 kilometers west of Baghdad, the Abu Ghraib prison had been used as a torture center during Saddam Hussein's dictatorship. The Americans took control of the site, but they didn't change the activities taking place within its walls. In the spring of 2004, a series of photos and reports emerged that shocked the world, evidence that US soldiers had tortured and sexually abused Iraqi detainees. Abu Ghraib was a catastrophic mistake. Uh, it is what we term a non-biodegradable mistake. It's never going away. Maybe there will be a half-life at some point, but those images, those pictures, those photos are still online, very easily found, uh, and that will continue to be a motivator uh, for those who want to criticize the United States uh, to generate support for extremist activities, and it did galvanize uh, Sunni Arabs in particular, uh, again, to fight the United States uh, in the years after that was discovered. Never before in the history of America has the President of the United States authorized human beings to be tortured. And that's what George W. Bush did. Under the heavy influence of Vice President Dick Cheney, and his counsel, David Addington, we violated domestic law, we violated international law for sure, when we tortured people. No accountability has been achieved. They're war criminals. If it means I go to jail as a war criminal, as long as they go to jail as war criminals, I'll be happy. The months slipped by, and the world slowly realized that the arguments for war tabled by the White House and the CIA director, George Tenet, were all false. I remember in August, he walked through the door to our offices and he said, have you heard the latest? George has still got those pictures up on his uh, website. I said, pictures, pictures? He said, yeah, pictures of the mobile biological labs. They're still there. And I said, well, obviously, George still believes that they were mobile biological laboratories. And Powell said, well, I guess that's the only leg of my presentation that's standing because all the others had been taken down over the course of the summer. A week later, he comes back in. He says, George just called me. <laughs> the last leg has collapsed. There were no biological labs. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, you know, you and I are both just naive as hell. That's the real problem. We're naive as hell. If US policies were sowing the seeds of chaos, then the Iraqi officials who the Americans had brought in and who they were working closely alongside were doing nothing to help calm tensions. Prime Minister Maliki pursued terrible sectarian activities that once again alienated the Sunni Arabs once again made them feel dispossessed and once again gave them an incentive in the failure of the new Iraq rather than its success. And of course, it was that which allowed Al-Qaeda in Iraq, now the Islamic State, uh, to reconstitute itself, to drift into Syria, to gain additional combat power and then come back into Iraq and cause such significant problems establishing a caliphate, which had Mosul as its headquarters in the north uh, and of course, Raqqa as its headquarters in Syria. Well, I 
معنا في كل في كل مرحلة وجوده إلا كان منسجما يعني وكنا نعمل معا واستطعنا أن نحقق انتصارات معا على داعش وعلى الإرهاب وإعادة توحيد العراق. As the years went by, the situation on the ground fluctuated between the bad and the very bad, with just brief glimmers of progress, such as the staging of elections. But there was still no answer to one key question about the early obsession of most neoconservative elements of the Bush administration. I think the, maybe the biggest question of them all, why did they decide to go into Iraq? That, and I think that is still the big unknown. Why? Saddam could hardly do anything. He wasn't a threat to anybody at the time. So I don't know anybody who can give you uh, a convincing answer to that question. Some of them still believe there are weapons. Pardon me. That's fucking insane. Pardon me. <laughs>